Welcome back to the Plowcast. This is episode four of the series covering the latest issue of the magazine, Beyond Borders. Today's going to get into some really heavy stuff, questions of justice and violence uh, that is important. So hold on. I'm Peter Momsen, editor of Plow Quarterly. And I'm Susanna Black, senior editor at Plow. So this is the episode where we talk about some of the topics that have concerned us most since the death of George Floyd one and a half years ago. Uh, Issues of crime, prison, policing, solitary confinement, uh, racism and racial justice, and the legitimacy of politically motivated violence. And we also uh, talk a lot about what it means to find healing after suffering. The central piece in our new issue of Plow, Beyond Borders, is also the longest piece we've ever published. It's by Ashley Lucas. It's called The End of Rage. And it's about the story of Russell Maroon Schultz, a imprisoned Black Panther who's been in prison since 1972, uh, in solitary confinement for almost 30 years of that time. And we're also going to hear from the son of Russell Schultz, Russell Schultz III, uh, from a conversation that he had with the author Ashley Lucas up here at Foxhole several weeks ago. How is it that you came to know um, about this story at all? How did you know Russell? Well, I first uh, met Russell, the dad, in a Pennsylvania prison cell, uh, well, in a visiting room of a prison, uh, back 20 years ago. At that time, uh, his son, Russell the uh, Third, who again will appear in this podcast in, in a few minutes, uh, was my co-worker and a co-founder of a magazine I was working on then, uh, Blue Magazine. It was sort of my first journalistic kind of project uh, in my early 20s. And he told me about his dad. Um, We were both involved at that time uh, in work around prisons and police brutality. And uh, he told me about his dad, this former Black Panther, who at that point um, had already been locked up for an insane amount of time. Um, and had been in solitary for, I think, five or six years at that point. Uh, and when I met him, you know, he just, it was just fascinating. I, I write a little bit about it in the editorial that introduces this issue of Beyond Borders. You know, he had this uh, in, incredible one-hour-a-day push-up squat routine that kept him physically fit, and he was just amazingly mentally alert, interested, fascinated in the history of the Rudolph community where I came from, um, interested in liberation struggles around the world, and just struck me as this incredibly alive, fascinating person um, who I then learned a lot from, uh, corresponded with um, for several years. So um, obviously it was sort of in part through your upbringing in the Bruderhof and the values that you learned there that you were kind of led to be involved in these kinds of prison justice, this kind of prison justice work. The Bruderhof doesn't only work with prisoners, it also works with the police to quite a surprising extent for a community that, you know, you guys are pacifists. So to just sort of settle the question of political violence, we are an anti-political violence magazine. We that we are yeah. a magazine committed to Christian nonviolence. Yeah. Absolutely. And so how how does that all work with both visiting prisoners and working with the police? Well, so... It is absolutely true that we work extensively with the police and have for years, um, notably with the Breaking the Cycle program, which uh, we, including uh, in partnership with PLOW, but uh, primarily our community offers in public schools in the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, um, where with the NYPD support, uh, we have speakers talking about nonviolent conflict resolution. we also have pastors from our communities um, active as, as chaplains with police forces. That's a whole other uh, topic that I won't get into now. But the basic idea, which I think is essentially the Christian idea, that we love our neighbor, that we're there ready to serve everyone, mm-hmm. um, be that a police officer, uh, you know, sworn to uphold the law and put himself or herself in danger to do so, or be that uh, someone incarcerated. Mm-hmm. Uh, who is equally a human being made in the image of God, whom we are to love and care for as ourselves. And, and so uh, I think that's, th- that explains how you can kind of do both, how you can care about both, uh, how you can try to be family to both. And I think, actually, 
and many, you know, many Christians and many Christian churches do that, but we, we ought to probably all do that a lot more. That, that sort of paradoxical nature that you don't have to choose whether you're going to fly the Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter, but uh, flag is mutually exclusive, yeah. I think is, is actually one of the most strange things about the gospel and the most wonderful things about the gospel. Yeah, I mean, like when we consider Christ's commands to visit the prisoner and when we consider it sort of the, the visiting of um, prisoners as one of the corporal works of mercy, those aren't necessarily prisoners who are innocent. Those are not necessarily people who are unjustly imprisoned. Those are just people who are in prison and justly or unjustly, that's a terrible place to be and they're human beings. And, um, but that balance, that sort of um, balance between upholding, you know, sort of the value of law enforcement officers and the value, the human value of prisoners um, is actually pretty well struck in the piece itself. Um, the End of Rage, again, is the title of the piece. Well, I think any truly told story mm -hmm. uh, is going to have, it's not even a balance, because not, it's not balancing one yeah. against the other as the, the truth of the humanity of, of all, both, both of the incarcerated person and, and their family, mm -hmm. and in this case, um, of the police officer who's killing, he participated in, you know, 50 plus years ago. And there's also, I mean, I remember when you had pitched this initially to um, Ashley Lucas, the, the author of the story, um, we don't get in, I don't think we're going to get into this as much with her today, but you had pitched it as the story of two fathers. And so your friend, Russell III, has two men who he considers fathers. Right, so the Proxima um, kind of catalyst for the story was a conversation that Russell III, the son of, of the imprisoned Russell, um, and I had about three or four years ago, where he told me this amazing experience um, about his other father. Mm -hmm. And let's hear Russell tell us about that. And Russell, of course, you've done a lot of work too with the families of the incarcerated. I remember uh, you, uh, attending last September with my daughter an event down in Philadelphia, and it was really striking um, just the kind of support group you've built for those who never feel like they can mention their family member. Um, the Mother's Day events you've done, and uh, could you tell a little bit about that work, how you got into it, and what's kind of become important to you from it, you know, over the years of working with families who have somebody in prison? Yeah, I just wanna, uh, I just wanna uh, thank you, Pete, and your daughter, and the Hoff, um, for coming to that family prisoners event, because it was in West Philadelphia, it was on 52nd Street, it was in the hood, um, but we have, a, we have a full farm there, in the hood, on 52nd Street, um, a, a little hoff there, we have a little hoff, we have our own little hoff there in the hood uh, with our animals, with our horses, with our, you know, uh, with our, our green and our patio and, uh, but in many houses, uh, tiny houses that we're building there. Um, if you want to learn more about that, one art community center that uh, Pete came to support us doing a family prisoner's dinner. Um, but we do that, um, we do a gang of work around families of the incarcerated um, simply because I'm a family of the incarcerated um, and that is work you know I'll be doing for the rest of my life um, but the intersection is obviously my father but that isn't the um, the end of that work and how it comes about I think it's super important for us to recognize um, in our communities, also as individuals, that it is key and probably more imperative than anything that our ideas around liberation, our ideas around religion, our ideas around uh, the things that ground us or base us that we actually put proper energy into them, that we actually um, do our due diligence in those ways and that it's not just, um, it's not just ideology, it's not just talk, it's not just a book, but we're actually 
manifesting those things from the book, from the ideology, whatever it is that you say that you believe, then we actually need to see that manifested um, through you and your everyday actions and community as an individual. And so that's a big part of my work daily. I'm just trying to daily manifest what it is that I say I believe. For years, even the years that I produced Blue Magazine with the Bruderhof, uh, I never really felt 110% comfortable with the duality, the dichotomy, the, uh, the intricacies of the fact that I was literally raised by a man of the cloth who was also a police officer. So there's not many police officers that are men of the cloth, period. Just period. So my childhood friend, we're in first grade. We're doing the, you know, uh, bring your, your, your mom and dad to school to talk about their job. And his dad comes in with the police uniform on. And, you know, I, I hang out with this guy all the time. And at that moment, I'm young, so I, I can't differentiate between Panthers and BLA members and police and stuff, whatever. I'm a kid. So uh, to make a long story short, this guy knows my dad, he knows my dad's case, he knows who I am as a child, and he invites me over. Um, his son, me and his son do homework all of the time together. But he says, come on over, you know, do some homework, so I come over, it's pizza. So I'm like, oh, that's cool, it's pizza. You know, I love pizza, everybody loves pizza as a kid. And so after we do our homework, I'm about to get out of there, and he says, hey, you know, you coming over tomorrow? And I'm like, nah, probably not. He's like, well, we're gonna have pizza again tomorrow. Uh, y'all have pizza again tomorrow? With a police officer standing with a pizza pie, a pizza and a police officer. And I said, oh, well, I, I, yeah, I'll, that's a bet. I'll see you. And what about the day after that pizza on the third day? Oh, we got pizza every day if you want it. You know, oh, well, we'll, we'll be doing math every day then. And so that relationship grew into... Um, him not just mentoring me, but he mentors this whole block, 52nd and Delancey, at that point in time, one of the biggest drug blocks in Philadelphia. And uh, he comes out and scrapes up the dead bodies of the young who've been shot in the middle of the street. Um, and he continues mentoring and he continues trying to get people to go to church and all of that. Um, but uh, he never put any pressure on me to try to go to church. He never put any pressure on me to not be on his block doing the things in the street that I shouldn't have been doing. No pressure, but always mentoring, like, what are you doing out here this time of night? You know? Um, and so this interaction uh, was tough on me in the context of me trying to live and embody a specific type of ideas and ideologies that are put out around people like myself and my dad and who you are, what you should be associating with, who you should be associating with, all of those ideas. And uh, uh, probably up until five years ago, I just grasped the ability to be able to say, this is my non-biological father. He's a police officer and a minister. And I support him in the movement the same way that I support my biological father. And you need to do the same. Um, and so that also brought him to a space, and we had always had conversations about my father, but brought him to a space where he was saying to me, what is it that I need to do for your father as a police officer? What is it that I need to say as a pastor? What is it I need to say as a bishop to your father, for your father, in a paper, in a visit? whatever it is I need to do, I'm here for you to do that. Um, so that is a kind of condensed version of Papa Barnes. Um, and I really actually don't feel comfortable being here, having this conversation about him without him being here. And I try very hard and we all try very hard to get him here. Um, but moving forward, uh, he is an integral part of Maroon, he's an integral part of the Shokes family, he's an integral part of uh, just who I am develop, developmentally wise. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, and, and I, I really can't say enough about the intersection of him and my father. Um, and uh, having, having more than 
two fathers, but him being probably at a strong number two um, and just how to embrace that all and how to, now I'm very happy to say, my father's a police officer, you know? And he's not the police officer that you think about. He's not the cop that y'all know. Half of the cops that y'all know and that people support, they don't, they don't have it. They can't cut it. They aren't police in the context that they need to be police. They aren't police that have a spiritual context. They aren't police that go up and scrape up the dead bodies off the block. They aren't the police that stayed in their community and didn't move out of the community because they made a lot of money to move out of the community. They aren't the police that won't stand up and go against police brutality that they see happening. They aren't the police that uh, won't stand up and say, hey, that's not proper code of conduct. I'm crossing the blue line. So I've been afraid to say who this officer is for all of these years for all of the wrong reasons. I, I feel it imperative among communities like the Bruderhof to do the internal struggle and work it is to help us confront these issues. If it's a writer's workshop, um, whatever it may be, um, because the community has a leverage. The community has the ability to have a bigger voice than individuals. The community has the ability to be able to leverage the state. The community has the ability to be able to leverage uh, 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 police officers. The community has the ability to leverage uh, 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 writers um, and, and, and uh, other artisans. Um, so we know um, in all communities there is a responsibility, there's an accountability um, to, to do. Um, now what the do is, how the do is done is a whole nother different question, but that accountability is there. It does not go away. It doesn't uh, get any smaller. Um, it doesn't uh, stop crying out to you to say, challenge yourself in these ways to figure where it is that the community lands on these questions because not to land on the question is unacceptable. Pete met my dad when my dad was uh, uh, of the mindset basically of a lot of uh, political prisoners, Black Panthers, BLA members at that point in time where they were just like, religion is opiate of the masses. And yeah, thanks Hoff for bringing me out of the hole and we're cool and we love writing to the kids and we want to support the kids and we want to do all of that. But at the end of the day, I'm about liberation and liberation and theology. Uh. And so he was one of these people who just was kind of like, eh, you know, the spirituality, eh, you know, and he had when he came into prison, studied Islam, and then found that it had its uh, schisms in prison as everything has in prison, um, and that people leveraged Islam in the improper ways, and that people, uh, people just did a lot of things Islamically, internally, in the prison that either resonated with him somehow or totally didn't resonate with him. Um, the murder of a warden because, uh, uh, by Jojo Bowden because, and Jojo Bowden wasn't a Muslim, but Jojo murdered the warden because the warden wouldn't let them have prayer. And he was feeding them pork sandwiches intentionally. So Jojo Bowden murdered the warden, went to have a little meeting with the warden and murdered him and the guards in the room and then whatever. But I say all of that to say that at that moment, my dad said, oh, yeah, no, nah, I don't know if I want to join you guys Islamically or whatever. Like, it's cool. I get it. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, and recently through COVID, through uh, the removal of his upper and lower intestines through stage four colon cancer and rectal cancer through COVID, through having COVID, um, all of that, all of that medical trauma 
and a lot of times medical trauma brings us to spirituality. Trauma in general, a lot of times can bring us to spirituality, but medical trauma, a lot of times just immediately, you know, makes you recognize your mortality. I think we all should question our mortality before that moment comes, before medical trauma has to make us question why are we here? How long are we here? Uh, what are we going to do while we're here? Uh, uh, if we die tomorrow, what have we done while we're here? Um, those questions have rushed at him through medical, through all of that. He said, oh, I need to think about my spirituality or my connection to the all. And so in that, he has embraced Islam and he has embraced a whole different outlook on um, what struggle means to him, what, um, what liberation theology means to him, what that would mean for him being a Muslim. Um, and so now uh, I interact with a new dad, you know, who is um, every phone call, you know, uh, Salam alaikum and peace be unto you. And uh, when are you taking your shahada? And uh, you know, on and on and on, which is which is great for me. You know, um, in the context of him finding something greater than himself outside of himself to aspire to, that is tied directly to his politics of liberation. And so. It's a new, uh, as Ashley said, my dad has went through all of these different iterations, you know, even the one of sitting with Pete and just, I'm a push-up guy, you know, and, uh, you know, to, to coming to a spiritual place and having some conversations with Ashley and the Hoff that are revealing of um, his want and need at this point in his life to... Um, to have conversations with people who he feels is important now to, to, to come to and say, hey, I'm a different guy. So now we'll welcome the author of the piece, The End of Rage, in our new issue, Beyond Borders, Ashley Lucas. Ashley is professor of theater and drama and is the former director of the Prison and Creative Arts Project at the University of Michigan. She is a fellow of the Ford Foundation, the UNC Faculty Engaged Scholars Program, and UNC's Institute for Arts and Humanities. Ashley, welcome. What can you tell us about this amazing story that you've written and how it came to be from your perspective? Thank you. The article that you all were so kind to commission me and invite me to write about the Schultz family has really been an incredible learning experience for me. I knew some things about the Black Panthers. I had heard of the Black Liberation Army. And I knew something of the radical politics of underground groups in the 1960s and 1970s, but I had not heard of Russell Maroon Schultz. And I, I think that one of the things that I'm most grateful for about the opportunity to write this was to get to know a bit of him and his family and to try to help other people know who he has been as an extraordinary figure in US history. Um, Russell, Russell Schultz was a young man growing up in Philadelphia, African-American in an African-American neighborhood where he regularly saw the police doing incredible harm physically and psychologically to people in his community. And he grew up a very angry person. He ended up deciding to join some radical political groups and actually to form them. Uh, the Black Liberation Army is a very strange sort of underground group and formed in several different cells independently from each other without those cells even really knowing about one another in different parts of the country. So the famous ones were in New York with Sada Shakur and Sethu Odinga and some other people, but uh, simultaneously and perhaps even a little bit earlier than that group's formation, Russell Schultz helped to form a Black Liberation Army in Philadelphia. And these were folks who felt very pressured uh, that their, their entire lives were on the line. It was not such a crazy idea as it seems today for folks to go underground, for folks to take up arms against the authorities as it was you know, in the 1960s and 1970s. Young people all over the country from all different racial and ethnic backgrounds, from all different class backgrounds were doing very similar things. They were, um, they were making their own bombs and blowing things up in protest of authority. They were protesting the Vietnam War 
And a whole lot of folks were really upset about police violence, which of course holds immense resonance with what we're experiencing today in the wake of, of George Floyd's death and so many others and in the, the Black Lives Matter era that we live in now. But Russell Schultz was, was doing some extraordinary things. He was trying to, to figure out how his community could cease living in what he felt was a police state. And he did some terrible stuff along the way. He was involved in the shooting of two police officers at the Fairmount Park Police Substation in Philadelphia on August 29th, 1970. And he was underground and managed to escape capture for a couple of years before he was finally arrested in 1972. At that time, he was given a life without parole sentence and went to prison and then became a kind of famous and interesting figure in prison because he, to the best of my knowledge, he is the person who has successfully escaped from Pennsylvania prisons more than anybody else. Um, and he, he is immensely creative and resourceful and intelligent and, um, and just a really, uh, my husband, who also writes for Plow, Phil Chrisman, has talked about Maroon, as I've done this research, as a kind of Homeric hero, that he often does things, you, you, he did things in the past that you really didn't like and didn't want him to do. But at the same time, you feel that you're kind of rooting for him because he, while he's doing things that are violent and unpleasant, he's also really rallying and organizing people who are genuinely oppressed about issues that really matter and ways of suffering that people shouldn't have to endure as a community or as individuals. Um, today, Russell Schultz remains in prison because of his escapes and things that were involved in them. He is currently serving two life without parole sentences and 25 years on top of that. So I don't know how you live, live twice and then another 25 years, but that's, that's the way our judicial system works. Um, he's 78 years old. He has stage four colorectal cancer that his doctors say is both terminal and aggressive. And he has recently been denied medical release by a Pennsylvania court. It's very difficult to justify the ruling of the denial of his medical release because he is now in a wheelchair. All of his intestines have been removed. He has a colostomy bag and he has survived COVID in that state in prison. And still the judge said at his medical release hearing that he was a danger to society. I find it very, very difficult to believe that a man who is 78 years old in a wheelchair with no intestines is a public threat that we need to be really keeping in prison for our own safety. That's, that's an excuse for something else. Um, so in writing this story, I really hope that the world can see how complicated every human being is. Uh, Russell Maroon Schultz is, is not all good or all bad. He has done a lot, a lot, a lot of things in his life and he has suffered immensely. And he also has a family that loves him very much. He's, he's had two different wives, one legal and one common law and seven children between them. And all of those folks love him very, very much. His children are all in their fifties and none of them have really known him in freedom. And I, I wish very much for their family to have the chance to know one another in freedom, to wear street clothes together and sit around a table and share a meal and do all the things that we wish any family would be able to do. So, sorry, that was a, a long preamble uh, because the story is a long and complex story, but those were, that's a, an essential <clears throat> outline of what I learned in the process of writing this. Well, I think the the, the term Homeric um, for Russell's story is, is absolutely right. Um, that this is a, a man of many twists and turns, to use Emily Wilson's translation of the uh, introducing Odysseus in the Odyssey. Um, and w one of the great strengths of, of this piece and why I feel it's so important is um, that you don't shy away from looking squarely at at that complexity um, without trying to weigh up sort of moral um, uh, balance sheets um, in, in a way that that cancel each other out and oversimplify things. So, for instance, um, we, we know, and and uh, Russell has admitted that he was involved in the murder on August 29, 1970, 
of a, a Philadelphia police officer, Sergeant Frank Von Collin, who himself had a family. Um, and part of the story that you tell is also a story of, of Russell himself, especially in the most recent years, thinking over uh, the legacy of political violence and, uh, you know, what what was it that he was responsible for? Um, and in fact, um, there is an amazing statement from him at the end of your piece. So uh, without spoiling anything um, for the reader, which we don't want to do on this podcast because we want you to read the whole piece. Um, could you could you t- tell a little um, for our listeners how do we sympathize and root for somebody who's a convicted cop killer? How do we sympathize and root for anybody? I mean, one of the things that people really fail to understand about incarcerated people is that they are not the sum total of the worst thing they ever did or the worst series of things that they ever did. All of us have done things that we are not proud of. All of us would like to be judged in the fullness of who we are, the complexity that each human being brings to life. And Russell Schultz is a really, really complex guy. I mean, he has done incredible things to mentor and organize other people who are suffering. One story that doesn't get told as fully in the pieces I would have liked just because it was already a really long um, article was about a time in Russell's life when he had entered a solitary, he was um, coming out of a stint in solitary confinement and a lot of the other men around him had been in long-term solitary confinement as well. And they were protesting the human rights violations that were happening in that prison and civil rights violations, lack of access to their families and to time to exercise and to shower and um, guards putting spit and bugs and things in their food deliberately so that, that they would be tortured. And these men were really, really smart about it. They went on a hunger strike but they didn't want to strike long enough for anybody to die. So they devised, um, they devised a system. Actually, Russell got transferred out of that prison for a while to go to a court hearing for something else. And when he came back, the other men around him had come up with the system of trading off being on hunger strike. So somebody would go on hunger strike for about a month and other people who were part of the strike would would basically rest a little while and eat and, and rejuvenate their bodies so that they could go on a hunger strike again. And the people who were, who were actually eating would be writing letters, contacting local radio stations, contacting their families, organizing people in the free world to say, there are all of these terrible things happening in the prison that nobody can know about because we live in solitary confinement. We need your help in the free world. This is how long all of these people have been on hunger strike and they kept it up for a very long time and then families got involved the radio was broadcasting things about what was happening in the prison and all of these family members who showed up in the parking lot of the prison to start protesting started getting taken off the visiting lists to see their loved ones and maroon and his colleagues were horrified about this and the families kept coming they wore ski masks so that they couldn't be profiled by the people in the prison and all of that actually resulted in the end of a certain segment of perpetual solitary confinement that these folks were enduring. And to to organize people who live in isolation, anybody who's a union organizer knows that some populations are easier to organize than others. To organize people in prison is incredibly, incredibly difficult because they live in this totalizing place where everything is controlled and literally your life is in the hands of your jailers all the time. So one of the reasons why Maroon is easy to become attached to emotionally as you read more about his story is that he always thinks beyond the obvious. He always thinks about a greater community. Um, Even though he did some things that were incredibly violent and selfish and unkind and hurt communities, there's this other side of him that is also equally sort of forceful and potent that is always advocating for large groups of other people who have suffered in ways that he has suffered. So he's constantly a, a, a big bowl of contradictions. He, he never is easy to explain, easy to write off, easy to ignore. He makes himself a, um, 
a forceful, often charming, often frightening presence in the lives of a lot of people. There's nothing simple about who he is. And, and we often center these conversations about who should be in prison and who should not on a notion that there are good and bad people. And I fundamentally believe that nobody is a good or a bad person. We wake up every day and make good and bad choices. We make choices towards kindness or towards harm or towards rage or towards love. And every day we're a set of new choices. And at the sum total of who you are is all of those things put together. You can't pretend that Russell Schultz didn't hurt people in really, really horrific ways, but you also can't pretend that he didn't help people in ways that matter, in ways that will leave legacies long after his death. Well, and as I mentioned in uh, introducing this conversation, the early part of this podcast, Ashley, I mean, I had the privilege of meeting Russell as 20 years ago now. And what you describe about his, you know, the, the, the sheer aliveness of his personality is the thing that probably stands out to me. Um, I also was corresponded with him for several years at the time and the creativity of mind uh, and the willingness to self-criticize and self-correct and rethink things um, is something that he, he, he struck me as one of the most intense and most alive people I, I had ever met. Now that was at that point, um, I believe around six years into a 22 year stint in solitary confinement um, which he underwent. Could you talk uh, with us about what, what does it mean to be locked up in solitary confinement for 22 years? It is the ultimate social death. When we put someone in solitary confinement, we have said, you are exiled, not just from the free world, but from the world inside this prison. We don't believe that you deserve human contact. We don't believe that you deserve loving touch. We don't believe that you deserve to have a conversation that doesn't have to be screamed through a wall. We don't even believe that you should get to shower every day. That's what we're saying when we put people in solitary confinement. The UN says that 15 days in solitary confinement is torture. Russell Schultz did nearly 30, 22 of them without a break. And part of what I never get past in the narrative of his life is that despite the fact that, yeah, he did some really violent stuff. He killed a person, he, uh, or he was involved in the killing of a person at least, and he harmed a lot of other people in myriad ways. It very, he was very creative in that as he was very creative in the good things that he had done as well. But when, they came, when it came time to what the state felt most threatened by, what they punished him most harshly for, it was because he had followed all of the correct procedures in the prison for forming an inmate organization and been elected president of a club that was meant for lifers, the men serving life in that prison. And the night he gets elected, they throw him in solitary confinement and he doesn't leave for 22 years. I mean, direct retaliation for the fact that he was politically organizing people who were living the same life that he was. And this was one of the times when he was actually organizing in a way that, that showed no indication of violence. He was just getting men to think about how do we as a community of people who, are, who have been told that we will die here, who are supposed to live our whole lives. And in Pennsylvania, there are a hell of a lot of people who are never supposed to leave prison because of the way their sentencing laws work. He looked at all those men and said, let's make the kind of life that we could best have here. Let's take care of each other. Let's build the kind of world that we have access to that we actually want to live in. Let's make our lives as good and productive and thoughtful and caring towards one another in this space as we possibly can. And that's what caused them to put him in isolation for 22 years. You don't even have control over what you read. You don't have control over who you talk to. You don't have control over what you're gonna wear or eat every day. And it is um, solitary confinement sounds like it is not the same thing as waterboarding somebody or doing some other kind of physical torture to a person. Um, I once read this piece in the New York Times, one of those things where they have an author talk about 
uh, what books you're reading and, and how you feel about being an author. And they interviewed Amy Tan, who may be a perfectly delightful person in a lot of other ways, but I've kind of never gotten over what she said in this, this little tiny New York Times piece that she wouldn't mind being in solitary confinement because she would just read and write. And I thought, well, good luck, lady, getting access to the books you want to read. Good luck at not having your writing taken away, confiscated and destroyed. Good luck at dealing with the immense noise. People think solitary is quiet, but that is absolutely not the truth. You're surrounded by people who are freaking out, so people whose mental illness has been incredibly exacerbated or, in, or even created by those conditions. There are people screaming. There are people throwing feces through the little tiny window in the door because it's the only form of protest that they have. It is an incredibly unpleasant, constantly harassing environment to be in. And, and one of the reasons also why it's hard not to in some ways fall in love with, with the sheer will to live. You said right now that he was more alive than anybody you'd ever known. You have to be to live for 22 years in solitary confinement in those conditions and come out not completely deranged or dead. A lot of people commit suicide in solitary and Maroon has survived. He has survived it all. He is surviving right now after having been told yet again that he is meant to die in prison. And his story, you know, Ashley, you've been involved um and issues surrounding prisons and and those incarcerated in them f- for a long time. I mean, the, the the fact that he was seemingly so arbitrarily um, subjected to these twenty two years of consecutive torture, t- you know, almost thirty years c- total of solitary, can seem, you know, just like surely that doesn't happen very often. But I think one thing that's important about this article is that those patterns, although Russell is in, in many, it is a, a unique and in some ways uniquely um, fascinating person, his experiences are not some um, statistical fluke. And could you talk a little bit, bit about that? Because I think, you know, so often um, issues of, of incarceration are talked about in terms of mass statistics. And I think one big reason um, that you wrote this piece and also that we wanted to publish it is because it's so important that it stops being a question of faceless statistics um, and that, you know, we, we see what it's like for a man, but also for his family. Absolutely. I, you know, the, the widespread use of solitary confinement for decades in the United States is absolutely appalling. We break all the records. We uh, defy all logic that that comes before us in human history about what prisons are meant to do and how they're they're meant to serve the greater good. What we're doing does not serve the greater good in any sense. And and we're locking up all kinds of people. Remarkably, Russell Schultz doesn't even come close to being the person who has served the most time in solitary confinement in this country. Louisiana has a terrible, terrible record for that. There were three men called the Angola Three who were also Black Panthers. And Albert Wood Fox, um, who is now in freedom, thank God, wrote an extraordinary book that was nominated for the National Book Award called Solitary. And people like him and Maroon are both a testament to the incredible cruelty, depravity, and humanity of the system that we have that we have built across hundreds of years and said that we have done so in our, in our name. You know, we, we put these people in solitary confinement in the name of the good citizens of the United States and say that, that we have agreed to this tacitly by, by making this our system of government, our system of judicial punishment. Um, and I don't want anybody to do that in my name. I don't, I don't want to keep killing people in my name either. Pennsylvania also has the death penalty. And, um, and Maroon watched a lot of people that he know end up dead because of that very system. So part of what, what writing this article means to me was a chance to put a face on, on these kinds of experiences and tortures to say this is just one among many people who have suffered. Nobody has a life quite like Russell Schultz's life in its totality, but all the different pieces of his life, all of the different ways in which the government 
intervened to physically harm, devastate, harass, and torture him and his family. That's all happened to other people in other ways. And it's happened over and over and over again. There is nothing in his story that is entirely unique that, that I read about it and thought, oh, this is a complete outlier. This is not happening to other people. This is not happening to other black folks in the United States, other people in prison. That's just not true. Everything that's happened to him has been perpetrated many, many, many times against other people and families. We tend to look for violence on the part of convicted criminals in prison, and we parse their violence very carefully. Um, that's not the only kind of violence there is. Um, and while I don't agree with the decisions of the Black Liberation Army and, and this piece, you're, you're not arguing for, for their tactics in this piece either, um, it is just helpful to know that at the same time that they were taking up arms against the United States government, which they saw as a, a, a racist um, apartheid government, uh, Nelson Mandela and his comrades in the ANC were doing the same um, in South Africa with the same justification and were likewise branded as terrorists and imprisoned. Uh, and our sort of conventional view of Nelson Mandela and the ANC is one thing, and our view of Russell Maroon Schultz and his comrades is another. Um, that really um, doesn't have a, a great deal to do with consistency of, of principles in regard to violence, and maybe just a lot says more about us than it does about where violence truly is in our society. Uh, and and that, th that comes through in your piece, Ashley, in a in a way that I think ought to challenge and provoke and disturb and unsettle um, all of us. None of us like those things happening to us. And it, they have to because there's five state prisons within 20 minutes of me where we're recording this podcast. Um, this is not somewhere else. And it's not just, you know, the, the other thing that, that your piece brings out, and, and I know when we were working on editing it, one of the, the toughest things was cutting out some of the testimonies of Russell's family. But when somebody is locked away for life, much less put in solitary for that amount of time, they are not the only ones who suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is a father of seven who's absent in the lives of seven kids. Could you talk a little bit about that aspect of this story? Sure. I, yeah, it was really gut wrenching to, to have to take out some of the stories that were told to me by Russell's children. I didn't get to speak to all of them in the, the research process, but Russell the third, his namesake and uh, Teresa, who is his oldest child and the only one who has a memory of her father and freedom were very generous in speaking to me about their family's experiences. And uh, Teresa's stories in particular really sort of upset the apple cart of how we tell stories about men in prison in particular. Often the narrative about men in prison is, is highly masculinist and independent that I'm doing this for myself and my people. And I'm, um, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, we're also very full of that, that highly masculine power rhetoric about how we protest what's happening in the world. And in the meantime, Teresa had to go to school at an elementary school that was right across the street from her mother's house. And they and the entire school watched the FBI break down the door and rifle through the family's house while Teresa's mother stands on the, at the front door screaming and asking them not to do this. All these men with guns run into the house while all of the children in the elementary school are being held in the schoolyard watching what's happening across the street because Russell had escaped and they thought he might be coming for his children, which in fact, he never did. He was, he was running off somewhere else where he thought he wouldn't be found. He never even vaguely attempted to go back for the children, but the FBI assumed that he would. And so Frank Rizzo's police officers in Philadelphia, Rizzo was the, the chief of police at the time, surround the elementary school and the Schultz home. They, the FBI almost end up shooting the family cat because they heard something in a closet that they thought was Russell and it was really just the cat. And 
after that happened, Teresa, Russell, and their sister, Sharon, were kids still trying to go to school across the street from where all of this happened. And everybody knew that their father was in prison. All the, the other school children knew it. The teachers knew it. The parents of all the other classmates knew it. And people started treating them really, really differently. Um, for Russell III, maybe because he was younger and maybe because he was a boy, his friends thought it was kind of cool and said, hey, can your father escape again so that we can have another day off from school? That was kind of exciting. Um, but people treated Teresa like a social pariah in a lot of ways. She developed chronic eczema as a, a, a sort of physicalized response to the trauma of constantly being evaluated. Um, Russell's mother, the children's grandmother intervened and got her moved to a different school, but then it all happens again. He escapes again and everybody knows about it again and folks are in the papers and another little girl at school is pushed to have a big fist fight with Teresa about the fact that her father is in prison. Um, there's just this, this sense of ongoing layers of trauma. And when I finally talked to Teresa on the phone about all of this, you know, she's in her fifties and, and I hardly asked her any questions. I just said who I was and what I was doing about this. And I talked about the fact that my own father spent 20 years in prison in Texas. And she was very open and very generous. And she spoke to me for several hours in a kind of stream of storytelling without me really asking questions. And then at the end of it, she said, I don't think I'm ever going to tell this story again. I don't, I don't want to talk to another reporter about what happened to my family. You know, I'm, I'm in my fifties. And at this point, I don't, I don't know any other life. People are always coming to me saying, let's protest about political prisoners. Let's protest about what's happening to folks inside the walls. Let's do this activism stuff. And she wants another life. She wants her father home very desperately, but she doesn't want her whole life to have to be the representative of the Black Panthers, you know, the children of the Panthers, the children of people in solitary confinement, the children of people in prison. It's a lot to put on somebody that she never chose and she was never guilty of any crime, no matter how you feel about her father. But this has been her whole life. And, and she made a lot out of it. She took in over 28 foster children, uh, a lot of whom had parents in prison like she did because she wanted to give a better grounding to other children. She did after school programming for the children of incarcerated parents. She's done all kinds of remarkable work to reach out into the world. And so have her siblings. And they are entirely marked by what has happened to their father. And they've never had the benefit of getting to hug him in freedom, you know, outside of all of that, except when Teresa and Sharon were very tiny, uh, they knew a little of that, but nobody remembers it anymore, but Teresa, because she's the oldest, you know, there are, are many differing accounts. I spoke with uh, Maroon's wife, Thelma, who is still married to him, but doesn't really talk to him and uh, has a lot of um, very righteous resentment of things that he did, not politically, but to their family specifically. And, uh, and the, the various members of the family, as I know from my own family, when you experience incarceration as a family unit, it really touches each life very differently. Every person is irreparably harmed by what happens when you send somebody to prison. Um, and, and we tend to, it's even hard to have the adequate language to explain what that means because we often talk about the crime, the trial, and the moment of somebody going to prison as these incredibly momentous defining things in a family's life. And in many ways they are, but the truth in my own life, I, you know, I can't, I would make the assumption for the Schultz family, but I won't speak it for them. In my own family, even though we spent like six years in court before my father was finally convicted, Everything that happened prior to the moment that he goes to prison was a very, very small thing compared to the 20 years that followed. And even after he came home and lived for five years in freedom before his death, that 20 years in prison shaped us a lot more than any of the stuff that led to his incarceration. Because imprisonment itself was the greatest violence. And that enduring consistent every day waking up knowing that my father was in a place that was unsafe 
that I could not really picture what his daily life looked like, that he could not eat healthy food or get adequate exercise or have adequate access to the news and information that I would want him to have, that he didn't have access to my life, that he missed the birth of his grandchildren, he missed my wedding, he missed all of my school graduations, that that constant sense that the person you love is not only not a part of everything that's happening out here and you can't draw on them for support or strength or comfort or all of the immediate things that you want your family for, but you also have this enduring, constant sense that the person you love is trapped in a place where you know they are not safe. And you don't even know exactly what that means, what they might not be safe from today, but they are not well, they are not healthy. They are not in a place where you feel like they're okay. And that's, you know, children of people who are deployed in the military to war zones tell the same stories. It is the sense that you don't really know what's happening, but you know, it's really scary. That trauma is a lot harder to describe and articulate than the dramatic stuff about here's what happened in the courtroom. Here's a crime story. Here's the story of the moment that incarceration happens, what it looks like to see somebody dragged off in handcuffs. All of that is really tiny compared to the enduring decades of trauma that follow. Wow, thank you, Ashley. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you for joining us, and uh, thank you for writing this, this piece. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or elsewhere, and please rate us as well, five stars on iTunes, which will spread the word to more people. We'll be back next week to talk more about Christian nationalism with a very special guest, Russell Moore. 